Thank you very much. Uh, my paper would be essentially looking at how the internet intermediaries uh, have been covered under the uh, Copyright Act, but I would be examining it in the wider context of the Information Technology Act. Uh, but uh, before I do that, I would uh, obviously like to start off with the background, uh, the history of the internet as we know it today uh, and in its earlier avatar called 1.0. One, 1 how the current uh, internet architecture has uh, facilitated uh, the e-commerce transactions as well as social speech, whether the standards of liability available under the, uh, under the IT Act uh, or the Copyright Act are internationally compatible, or do they constitute exercise in what we call shooting the messenger, and whether these standards of liability are in sync, uh, because we have two statutes today, the IT Act and the Copyright Act, and uh, there have been uh, uh, interpretations of uh, the standards of liability, uh, whether these standards are consistent, and how these uh, uh, standards are constitutionally valid. So let's start off. Um, how do I take it forward? Yeah. The early internet, uh, as we all know, was uh, essentially static. It did not really have any human interaction. Uh, it was a kind of phone book. Uh, users were only allowed to read uh, or view online information. Uh, it was like uh, if one were to look for a law firm in New York, uh, the search would uh, return a web page with very static, unidimensional kind of information. Uh, it might perhaps give you information about the practice of the firm, uh, the attorneys and their profile, but it was a very passive viewing experience. Uh, it would not take you beyond what was available uh, on the website. In contrast, if you visit the very same website today, uh, in addition to the information already available in the earlier version, uh, you could uh, perhaps access uh, your own uh, status. Uh, a candidate could even post uh, his or her resume on the website, track the status of the same, and perhaps even attend an online interview. So in a way, uh, what Web 1.0 was uh, essentially uh, changed uh, when Web 2.0 happened. However, the technological developments of satellite technology, broadband connections, peer-to-peer -peer technology uh, ushered in a platform where it became possible to collaborate and interact. In a way, uh, this is just a graphic representation of how Web 1.0 used to look like. Uh, so you would have a webmaster, a website, and then a multitude of internet servers looking at uh, a static online experience. Uh, when Web 2.0 happened, and as I explained, uh, two important developments, peer-to-peer -peer technology and uh, broadband connections, uh, made uh, the Internet uh, into what uh, we understand it to be today, high-speed connections. And there were two defining moments of uh, Web 2.0 experience, inherent collaborative nature and, uh, and interaction. These were the two defining um, elements of the Internet. Uh, the bulletin boards have been rightly considered to be the precursors to uh, Web 2.0 in, 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 in that uh, content posted on the World Wide Web uh, was available for viewing in an interactive way. Uh, and uh, in, a, in a bulletin board scenario, it was an interactive environment for uh, uh, members to post their content. Uh, this uh, naturally created an opportunity for uh, uh, websites with Web 2.0 characteristics uh, like auction sites, social networking websites. And the user in this Web 2.0 experience became at once a recipient and uh, a creator of content in a virtual reflection of the real world. These inherent qualities of the Internet uh, enabled websites to innovate and offer services such as hosting, linking, transmitting, and indexing content. Uh, it, in a way, revolutionizes the way we uh, bang, uh, listen to music, uh, watched movies, turned and shopped for products and services in the, in the virtual world. In a way, Web 2.0 has changed the way uh, we have uh, uh, understood uh, the Internet. And this is just a graphic representation 
description of how Web 2.0 looks like today. So you have a website uh, with multitudes of users arranged around it. And there is uh, an interactivity, so there is a depth to the website. You can go inside, you can access material. So in a way, this uh, afforded an opportunity for what we call the e-commerce transactions and uh, enhanced uh, the possibilities of wider social speech. Now, when we look at uh, the internet in its web 2.0 avatar, uh, we obviously look at the way uh, transactions are conducted on the internet. How uh, these transactions uh, are ultimately facilitated by a number of intermediaries. Because these intermediaries provide access to host, transmit, index, third party content and services. And uh, there are various types of intermediaries which are involved here. Uh, because intermediaries essentially bring together or facilitate transactions uh, between third parties on the internet. And uh, the various types of intermediaries we are looking at are uh, internet access and service providers. These uh, intermediaries essentially provide subscribers with their data, data connection allowing access to the internet through physical transport infrastructure. Uh, web hosting or data processing or content delivery platforms, uh, which, uh, for example, cloud computing is an example of it. These are platforms that enable their clients to use the internet to access services such as software as a service or hardware as a service. Then we have uh, another kind of intermediaries, internet search engines or portals, which essentially aid in navigation on the internet, like Google, Yahoo are two primary examples. Then we have payment systems, uh, which enable online buying and selling, uh, or uh, Visa, PayPal, MasterCard, then participative network platforms. These uh, uh, network platforms essentially aid in creating content and uh, social networking. Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn are primary examples of uh, participative network platforms. However, uh, when uh, content is carried uh, over the internet through the participation of these intermediaries, that content may, may be fraught with legal liability. It could involve civil liability or criminal liability. The content may be obscene, defamatory, or racist. It could even interfere with or infringe trademarks or copyright or other third party rights. Uh, and there are certain areas of content liability which are administered by the state. So these are cognizable offenses, so the state could intervene. And then there is the other aspect of uh, threats to free speech. In um, one of the earliest cases uh, which happened in the US, it's uh, actually called Religious Technology uh, Center versus Netcom. And it, it is actually a pre-DMCA decision. It happened in uh, 1995, and DMCA happened in 1998. Uh, it was uh, essentially uh, a case which dealt with the liability of uh, a bulletin board uh, operator and an internet service provider. Uh, and there was content being shared on this bulletin board service through the intervention of the ISP, uh, which uh, uh, was thought to be infringing by Religious Technology Center. And uh, the court looked at uh, the standards of liability of a BBS operator and ISP in the context of uh, uh, third party or third party users. And uh, a very interesting part of the judgment is that even before the WIPO treaties uh, were concluded, uh, uh, the US court had uh, the uh, pre science, uh, the ability to anticipate some of the arguments which uh, intermediaries and content owners uh, uh, later raised. And I will just read out uh, one important uh, aspect of this judgment. Uh, the, the court actually held, this court is not persuaded by plaintiff's argument that NETCOM, uh, which was the ISP, is directly liable for the copies that are made and stored on its computer. 
where the infringing subscriber is clearly directly liable for the same act. It does not make sense to adopt a rule that could, the, could lead to the liability of countless parties whose role in the infringement is nothing more than setting up and operating a system that is necessary for the functioning of the internet. Such a result is unnecessary as there is already a party directly liable for covering the copies to be made. Plaintiffs occasionally claim that they only seek to hold liable a party that refuses to delete infringing copies after they have been warned. However, such liability cannot be based on a theory of direct infringement where knowledge is irrelevant. The court does not find workable a theory of infringement that would hold the entire internet liable for activities that cannot reasonably be deterred. Billions of bits of data flow through the internet and are necessarily stored on servers throughout the network and it is thus practically impossible to screen out infringing bits from non-infringing bits because the court cannot see any meaningful distinction without regard to knowledge between what Netcom, that is the ISP, did and what every other Usenet server does, the court finds Netcom cannot be held liable for direct infringement. And there was a very interesting footnote to this judgment, uh, which again uh, uh, anticipates uh, the arguments which were later raised. Netcom compares itself to a common carrier that merely acts as a passive conduit for information. In a sense, a Usenet server that forwards all messages acts like a common carrier, passively retransmitting every message that gets sent through it. Netcom would seem no more liable than the phone company for carrying an infringing facsimile transmission or storing an infringing audio recording on its voicemail. As Netcom's counsel argued, holding such a server liable would be like holding the owner of the highway or at least the operator of a toll booth liable for the criminal activities that occur on its roads. Such other similar carriers of information are not liable for infringement. There is some basis for exempting internet access providers from liability for infringement by their users. So in a way, uh, this case uh, anticipates uh, the intermediaries case for immunity from content. Uh, they uh, argued that they did not have uh, effective legal or actual control over the content which was passing through their servers. Uh, that there was an in inequity in imposing liability on a mere messenger and consequences for the public interest. Uh, and it would be virtually impossible for them to manually check for the legality or otherwise of each file that passes through their servers. Besides these uh, above arguments, uh, the intermediaries also argued that the very survival of e-commerce and the information society depends on an immunity regime in which they are spared from liability on account of content generated or created by others. If it were otherwise, the intermediaries would be uh, deterred and discouraged from participating and investing in e-commerce because the burden and cost of liability, exposure and monitoring content would make their business models economically unviable. In contrast to this um, argument raised by the intermediaries, the state's case was that uh, the ISPs or the internet uh, service providers are the only effective gatekeepers uh, to, uh, to the internet and it's important uh, for these intermediaries uh, to uh, be available for direct um, uh, uh, liability and uh, in a way unless uh, the ISPs were made liable it would open the floodgates for dissemination of pornography, terrorism, libel and so they were arguing for uh, uh, ISPs being burdened with uh, a liability to make sure that uh, this kind of content did not get through. So as a result of uh, these two uh, diametrically opposite views, uh, there was, uh, it really spawned what we call the notice and takedown regime, which was essentially the consensus achieved as a result of this debate in which each side had merits to its claim. The notice and takedown regime proceeds on the basis that an intermediary is not liable for any third party content which passes through it or is stored by it on its servers so long as it has no knowledge of the same. However, once it has gained knowledge of such content, it must act diligently to disable access or remove such content. Failure to act after knowledge would take away the safe harbor and expose the intermediary to liability. In in one of the recent cases in Australia, and it happened just a week or two ago, uh, Google as a search engine was found liable uh, as a publisher of defamatory material 
and, and it was denied the defense of uh, innocent disseminator on the ground that it had been notified by the claimant of the defamatory nature of content and it failed to remove the same. Uh, and uh, it uh, enacts uh, four kinds of safe harbors for four specific types of activities performed by service providers. Uh, the first one is uh, provision of a network for transitory communication. So which would cover uh, telecommunications carriers or internet access providers, system caching, storage of information on systems or networks at direction of users, MySpace, uh, Facebook would be a few examples of those, and information location tools. And the safe harbor against copyright liability is available under the DMCA if an online service provider removes or disables access to allegedly infringing material upon receiving a notice of infringement from a copyright owner or its agent in compliance with the DMCA statutory requirements. So this is a regime which is conditional on uh, a notice and takedown regime. So the moment uh, an intermediary is notified of uh, the infringing nature uh, the copyright violative nature of the content, then it has to take it down. Uh, as against uh, this conditional uh, safe harbor available for, for copyright violations, there is an absolute uh, level of uh, intermediary uh, immunity available in respect of uh, other forms of content. And that's covered in the Communications Decency Act, Section 230C for other civil wrongs. And it says no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided uh, by another information content provider. This provision has in a way served as the bedrock of immunity for ISPs in the US in respect to defamation, false information, minus. So that's in a way an illustration or an application of the first uh, amendment uh, right in the US. In, in Europe, uh, the intermediary liability uh, has essentially, is essentially governed by a horizontal content neutral approach, and that's found in e-commerce directive 2000 by part 31, uh, which uh, essentially uh, enacts uh, safe harbors in respect of mere conduits, caching, and hosting. In respect of uh, uh, mere conduits, uh, the, uh, and conduits here would mean, uh, in fact, it's defined to mean an information uh, where the transmission in a communication uh, or the provision of access to a communication network uh, and, and uh, this such kind of service provider is not liable for the information transmitted on condition that the provider does not initiate the transmission, does not select the receiver of the transmission, and does not select or modify the information contained in, in the transmission. So, so the conduit safe harbor is available for telecommunications uh, uh, carriers, uh, backbone uh, providers, uh, internet access providers. Uh, the e-commerce e directive uh, uh, enacts an absolute level of safe harbor for mere conduits. The second uh, uh, intermediary uh, covered in the e-commerce directive is uh, in respect of caching services. The language is more or less the same. The provider sh does not modify the information. The provider complies with conditions on access to the information. The provider complies with the rules regarding the updating of the information specified in a manner widely recognized and used by industry. The provider does not interfere with the lawful use of technology widely recognized and used by industry. The third kind of um, intermediary um, um, immunity is available in respect of hosting service. Uh, and and uh, the, re the directive actually says that the service provider is not liable for the information stored at the request of a recipient of the service on condition a, that the provider does not have actual knowledge of illegal activity or information and as regards claims or damages is not aware of facts or circumstances from which the illegal activity or information is apparent or B, the provider upon obtaining such knowledge or awareness acts expeditiously to remove or disable access uh, to the information. Uh, the uh, three uh, kinds of safe harbor available in e-commerce directive did not uh, specifically extend to 
uh, search engines. However, uh, the European Court of Justice found in Google Inc. versus Louis Vuitton uh, on March 23, 2010, that uh, the harbor uh, available under e-commerce directive would extend to, to such uh, ad word referencing service. In fact, uh, the, the court went on to say that uh, uh, Directive 2000 bar 31 bar EC must be interpreted as meaning that the rule laid down therein applies to an internet referencing service provider in the case where that service provider has not played an active role of such a kind as to give it knowledge of or control over the data stored. If it has not played such a role, that service provider cannot be held liable for the data which, ha which, which it has stored at the request of an advertiser unless having obtained knowledge of the unlawful uh, nature of those uh, data or, or of that advertiser's activities, it failed to act expeditiously to remove or to disable access to the data concerned. In uh, uh, another judgment, L'Oreal versus eBay, the directive was uh, found applicable to an operator of an online marketplace, uh, eBay. And uh, the, the European Court of Justice went on to say that this directive must be interpreted as applying to the operator of an online marketplace where that operator has not played an active role, allowing it to have knowledge or control of the data stored. Uh, so in a way, uh, the safe harbors available uh, in respect of um, hosting, caching, have been extended to search engines and uh, online marketplaces. Uh, in um, a, a very important judgment in the, in, in the UK, it's called the Newsbin 2 case, uh, which actually related to British telecommunications. Uh, uh, British Telecommunications was um, essentially a telecommunications carrier in the UK and there was a pirate and rogue website called Newsbin and it was established in an earlier judgment and that judgment is popularly called Newsbin 1 that um, uh, the, the website Newsbin uh, was essentially a rogue website. In this uh, uh, matter, the UK court was uh, confronted with an argument that uh, British Telecommunications was essentially a telecommunications provider. Uh, it was a carrier and it was entitled to an absolute level of uh, immunity uh, under the uh, conduit uh, safe harbor uh, in the e-commerce directive. Uh, however, uh, the UK court um, uh, interpreted Article 15 uh, of, of the e-commerce directive to uh, essentially mean that um, uh, even if uh, the safe harbor was applicable to, uh, to, uh, to BT, uh, it, it would still be uh, uh, subject to the long arm of the court. And uh, so this uh, uh, is actually a very important judgment. And, uh, uh, and uh, so, the, so the court actually interpreted that member states uh, uh, would be uh, would be entitled would be free to uh, subject uh, when a conduit safe harbor provider to uh, the court's jurisdiction. Now, Article 15 of the directive is 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 very important. Uh, it says that member states uh, cannot impose or do not have a general monitoring obligation on intermediaries. Uh, in fact, the first case to go to the International Court of Justice, uh, the European Court of Justice, was Scarlet versus Sabin. In this case, Scarlet was essentially a collective society, and um, uh, Sc Scarlet was essentially an internet service provider, and Sabam was a collective society. And it was a dispute uh, involving uh, the customers of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, the, the ISP, the internet service provider, who uh, gained access to the internet and they were able to download uh, the content uh, which actually fell in the repertoire of Sabam. Uh, Sabam contended that internet users using Scarlet services were downloading works in Sabam's catalog from the internet without authorization and without paying royalties by means of this peer-to-peer -peer network. And uh, the collective society sought an order requiring Scarlet to bring such infringements to an end by blocking or making it impossible 
for its customers to send or receive in any way files containing a musical work using peer-to-peer -peer software without the permission of the right holders. The Court of Appeal Brussels posed to the European Court of Justice a very specific question for interpretation. The question was uh, that, that the national courts may also issue an injunction against intermediaries whose services are used by a third party to infringe a copyright or related right to all an ISP to install for all its customers in abstracto and as a preventive measure exclusively at the cost of that ISP and for an unlimited period a system for filtering all electronic communications both incoming and outgoing passing via its services in particular those involving the use of peer to peer software in order to identify on its network the movement of electronic files containing a musical, cinematographic or audiovisual work in respect of which the applicant claims to hold rights and subsequently to block the transfer of such files either at the point at which they are requested. Now this uh, question is very important in the context of uh, what we were discussing in you know, the John Doe orders, uh, whether uh, an ISP should really be burdened with uh, that kind of uh, uh, the court noted that implementation of a filtering system of the kind sought by Scarlett would require the ISP to identify with all of uh, the electronic communications of, of all of its customers, the files relating to peer-to-peer -peer traffic within that traffic, the ISP must identify uh, the files containing works in respect of which holders of intellectual property rights claim to hold rights, determine which of those files are being shared unlawfully, and then block file sharing that it considered to be unlawful. The court found that such preventive monitoring would require active observation of all electronic communications conducted on the network of the ISP concerned and consequently would encompass all information to be transmitted and all customers using that information. And the court held, and this is very relevant uh, to what is happening in India today, in the present case the injunction requiring the installation of the contested filtering system involves monitoring all the electronic communication made through the network of the ISP concerned in the interest of those right holders. Moreover, that monitoring has no limitation in time, is directed at all future infringements and is intended to protect not only existing works but also future works that have not been yet been created at the time when the system is introduced. Accordingly, such an injunction will result in a serious infringement of the freedom of the ISP concerned to conduct its business, since it would require that ISP to install a complicated, costly, permanent computer system at its own expense, which would also be contrary to the conditions laid down in Article 3, which requires that measures to ensure the respect of intellectual property should not be unnecessarily complicated or costly. So the same uh, uh, ratio was reiterated in Sabna versus Netlog, uh, which happened subsequent to this. In India, the standards of uh, intermediary liability are governed by two statutes, uh, the Information Technology Act, which was enacted with effect from 17th October 2000, and uh, the uh, purported objective of the act was essentially to uh, provide a legal framework for promotion of e-commerce and and e-transactions. And it's important to look at uh, the uh, definitions uh, which existed before 2008 and post-2008. In its original avatar section, uh, the intermediary was defined uh, in, the, in the IT Act uh, with respect to any particular electronic message uh, was meant, uh, was, means any person who on behalf of another person receives stores or transmits that message or provides any service with respect to that message. And Section 79 of the IT Act before uh, the 2008 amendments was again not very happily worded. It, it, it uh, read, for the removal of doubts, it is hereby declared that no person providing any service as a network service provider shall be liable under this Act rules or regulations made thereunder for any third party information or data made available by him if he proves that the offence or contravention was committed without his knowledge or that he had exercised all due diligence to prevent the commission of such offence or contravention. For the purposes of this section, network service provider means an intermediary and third party information means any information dealt with. The important thing to note in this definition was that the onus to prove that the intermediary had uh, uh, no knowledge uh, lay on, on the intermediary. Uh, the intermediary had uh, the, the onus to, to 
to, to discharge. And there's a very interesting judgment of Kerala High Court. It's a DB judgment uh, in which, um, and in this DB judgment, uh, the High Court was confronted with the scope and effect of Section 81 of the IT Act in relation to a right claimed under the Copyright Act. The factual matrix in which this, came, this case came to be adjudicated uh, by the High Court of Kerala involved a software, uh, a software application called FRIENDS. And the FRIENDS was actually an acronym for Fast, Reliable, Instant, Efficient Network for Disbursement of Services. The development of such a software was part of a project conceived by the government of Kerala and uh, was aimed at creating a single window uh, collection facility for uh, bills payable by individuals uh, to the various statutory agencies, government corporations, or local authorities. The government of Kerala, through its various departments, entrusted the petitioner, Feroz, with the task of developing the friend software. After the petitioner developed the software and set up the friends service center in Kerala, the government of Kerala uh, and other state-owned agencies sought to modify the software to suit their further requirements. Subsequently, the government of Kerala issued a notification under Section 70 of the IT Act declaring the French software as a protected system for the purpose of the said Act. Claiming to be the first owner of copyright in the software, the petitioner challenged the constitutional validity of this notification as arbitrary, discriminatory and violative of Article 19.1g of the Constitution and against the statutory rights conferred on him uh, under Section 17 of the Copyright Act. Agreeing with the view taken by the single judge, because it was uh, essentially an appeal uh, the DB was concerned with, the division bench of the High Court of Kerala approved of the following observations of the single judge. Uh, the DB held, I am of the view that Section 70 of the IT Act is directly related to Section 2K and 17D of the Copyright Act, and government's authority to notify any system as protected applies only to such of the system which answers the description of government work as defined in Section 2K of the Copyright Act. In other words, a notification under Section 70 of the IT Act is a declaration of copyright under Section 17D of the Copyright Act, which only applies to government works within the meaning of Section 2K. In other words, Section 70 of the IT Act is not against but subject to the provisions of the Copyright Act, and the government cannot unilaterally declare any system as protected other than government work. However, if the government proceeds to declare any other computer system or network other than government work falling under Section 2K of the IT Act as a protected work, it will be open to the aggrieved party to challenge such action as arbitrary and unauthorized. All matters connected with copyrights can be resolved by the provisions in the Copyright Act as it is a special act for that purpose and matters regarding information technology have to be resolved by applying the provisions of the Information Technology Act as it is a special act for that purpose. And this uh, judgment happened even before the 2008 amendments happened because the non obstante clause in Section 81, which is notwithstanding anything to the contrary in any other law. Still, the revision bench of Kerala High Court took the view that uh, the Copyright Act is a special act and the rights governed by the Copyright Act cannot be bartered away, taken away by the government. And uh, this judgment is currently under appeal uh, before the Supreme Court of India. And uh, then there is uh, one uh, other very important case, uh, Google India versus Vishaka Industries, uh, which uh, dealt with the, the issue of uh, defamatory content. And in this case, the High Court of Andhra Pradesh. Okay. Uh, in Google India versus Vishaka Industries, uh, the Madras, uh, the, uh, uh, the High Court of Andhra Pradesh had the occasion to deal with the applicability of Section 79 Safe Harbors, uh, and uh, it was a complaint of defamation um, of certain politicians through articles posted on Google.com. Despite having been notified, Google India did not move access to these articles. Google India relied upon the defense under Section 79 and claimed immunity. The uh, court did not agree with Google India on the basis uh, that uh, it had already been notified of the defamatory content and still it did not act. So therefore it had lost uh, the safe harbor available under Section 79. The Copyright Act um, uh, did not have any specific safe harbors uh, before um, June 2012 and uh, liability used to be uh, essentially governed by, uh, e by by the secondary uh, infringement um, 
uh, standards of Section 511B, and uh, you're all familiar with the uh, judgment uh, in SCIL versus MySpace, uh, where the High Court of Delhi took the view that uh, MySpace uh, was secondarily liable for infringement because apparently uh, whatever content was passing through its service or was being stored by MySpace uh, uh, was uh, found by the judge to have been within the knowledge of MySpace. And uh, there has been a spate of John Doe orders as well, which uh, again uh, would seem to be contrary to the very concept of intermediary liability uh, available uh, uh, worldwide and uh, at the relevant time under the IT Act. Post uh, June 2012, uh, the amendments uh, to Section 52 have uh, essentially looked at uh, uh, two kinds of intermediaries. 521B uh, essentially immunizes. Uh, intermediaries uh, which are involved in transient or incidental storage purely in the technical process. And uh, since uh, there is no proviso attached to it, there is no caveat attached to it, it would appear that um, uh, the immunity available in terms of 521B is, is an absolute immunity from copyright infringement uh, and should be available to internet carriers or internet access providers and it's akin to the conduit safe harbor in the European Directive. Uh, in contrast to the absolute um, uh, standard of liability under 521B, Section 521C looks at transient or incidental storage for the purpose of providing electronic link access or integration. And uh, two essential um, conditions, uh, unless the ISP is aware or has a reasonable ground, which means actual knowledge or constructive knowledge, and then there's a procedure laid out uh, uh, in a proviso to the section. It says that the ISP uh, is furnished with a court order refraining it or restraining it from facilitating access to the infringing copy within 20, 21 days. Uh, the report of the Standing Committee uh, essentially looked at uh, the proposed amendments uh, in the context of uh, internet service providers uh, and how to immunize them. And there were conflicting uh, submissions made by ISPs such as Yahoo and eBay. And uh, having taken all those conflicting um, uh, submissions or, uh, uh, into account, the Standing Committee concluded that a period of 21 days for a court order in provision for transient or incidental storage would take care of ISP concerns. The, the question is, uh, uh, does 521C uh, uh, covers all kinds of intermediaries? The language is not very happily worded and uh, uh, because uh, you compare it uh, against the language of Section 79 or the uh, uh, intermediary uh, due diligence guidelines, uh, there are certain expressions which uh, are found missing here. However, uh, looking at the legislative history of uh, 521 P and C, it would appear that uh, the intention of the legislature was to immunize all kinds of intermediaries. And then we uh, look at the issues whether uh, the Indian laws and judicial trends are compatible with 19 A, B, or G, and um, there have been a uh, number of cases, Rajagopal versus Tamil Nadu. And in fact, RK Production versus BSNL uh, is a very interesting judgment of Madras High uh, Court. Uh, this judgment relies uh, very, very liberally and uh, substantially upon the MySpace judgment. And uh, what is surpri surprising about the judgment is uh, the intermediaries involved in BSNL uh, would fall within the safe harbor of 521B, and they didn't even raise this safe harbor before the high court. If they had raised it, uh, the uh, ratio would have been different. Thank you. Yeah, so we'll uh, quickly take some uh, <coughs> questions from Mr. Kumar. So if any questions, we can take one or two questions before we to the full fledged. Yes, please introduce yourself and ask the pointed questions if possible. Thank you. Good evening, sir. This is Ashutosh Padhya from Simbasa International University. Uh, sir, I have basically two general questions. Uh, the first question is that whenever we deal with any issue related to internet and uh, websites, the first thing which comes to our mind is how are we supposed to resolve the jurisdiction issues? Issue which arises, jurisdiction issue which arises, like which code is supposed to be liable if we have, I have uploaded a video in India and it's been used in USA, where the jurisdiction will be lying. The second question being like, there is always uh, a parent uh, provider and there is a subsidiary. Like we have Facebook and then Google India, completely different from the real owner of Facebook and Google. Uh, the second question being that when uh, we have uploaded something on a particular website 
and it's a subsidiary website not an not the parent one uh, when we claim when the when it's a when the video is of a nature of copyright infringement the owner of that video if he claims that subsidiary to remove it can he say that he is not liable for it and the parent uh, company or the parent isp is liable for that uh, these are the two basic questions actually uh, delhi high court has uh, looked at uh, the issue of online uh, jurisdiction in a very famous case called the banyan tree case it's a division bench judgment of delhi high court and uh, it uh, looks at uh, the concept of uh, online accessibility of content in any part of the world uh, because if uh, online accessibility of content were to be the basis for jurisdiction then uh, an isp or any website could be potentially sued in any part of the world so the high court of delhi has essentially laid down certain guidelines if a website in question is targeting the users in a given jurisdiction it's called the forum state and there is a commercial benefit to uh, to that targeting uh, and uh, the uh, plaintiff uh, let's say the content owner uh, uh, has effected some trap purchases or uh, for example has set up decoy customers so there is a procedure uh, laid out in in the dv judgment as to how the content owner will have to go about um, uh, setting up decoy customers so these are the principles laid down so, so that's uh, one part of the uh, of the answer that uh, online uh, jurisdiction in india is governed by certain principles and even in the us we have the long arm statute uh, where you know one could sue uh, a non forum uh, uh, defendant in another part of the us on the basis that uh, the damage per se is felt in the forum state and the same logic applies in india as regard the second question uh, if uh, the parent company has an interest in the affairs of the subsidiary then it is vicariously liable for the acts of the subsidiary company so it cannot hide behind this corporate uh, severability can i ask uh, sir uh, the, my question is again to mr rajendra so the space judgment uh, seems to take a very narrow view of the expression person responsible is aware or has reasonable grounds for believing that such storage is of an infringing copy now from what i see the same language is retained in 521c even after the amendment now do you think then that the my space judgment holds to be good law that is subject to the single judge's view being affirmed by the db uh, then would the amendment really make a difference at all as far as file sharing sites are concerned yeah it's yeah you're right my space judgment is uh, currently under appeal uh, i had uh, actually argued for my space before the high court of delhi yes and uh, the interpretation taken by a single judge uh, is definitely flawed yeah uh, uh, in fact uh, the single judge uh, has gone on to hold that uh, post uh, infringement measures would not be a sufficient safeguard yeah and uh, uh, but you know if you look at the concept of vicarious liability uh, under section 5112 uh, it would again require some kind of actual knowledge or facts and circumstances from which it could be gleaned that the intermediary concerned was actually aware of it simply because uh, billions of bits of data would pass through a ser the, the servers uh, or you know those uh, infringe those are infringing bits it's, it's literally impossible to severe or segregate the infringing bits from uh, the non infringing bits so uh, as the law stands today uh, there is a proviso uh, also added to section 521c which requires um, the uh, content owner to first notify the isp as to the urls or uh, the the nature of the infringing work and then there is a 21 days period given within which um, the uh, owner will have to go to the court and get an order of injunction but yes it will uh, be ultimately decided by the court as to what is the import of uh, uh, constructive knowledge and yes. actual knowledge components of 50 c thanks we just one picture on camera uh, this is a very general question uh, with the amendments the um, an isb is being protected by the copyright act itself how do you see the coexistence coexistence of the it act and the copyright act the isp the intermediaries because uh, i don't remember the exact guidelines but there were guidelines for intermediaries under the it act which also had very similar provisions and uh, of course there was also 79 and then there was the 81 which was nothing um, you know not 
notwithstanding the Copyright Act. And now the same provisions to some extent have been incorporated. So I'm just trying to understand how does it uh, coexist. Uh, the uh, April 2001 notification was essentially an executive order. Uh, and even uh, uh, during the time when um, uh, the IT Act was not amended, the High Court of Kerala took the view that uh, the standards uh, under the Copyright Act are independent of those under the IT Act, because the Copyright Act is a special act. So if some work is created uh, which vests independent rights of ownership uh, in a particular author, uh, unless and until it is a government work, uh, the government cannot intervene in of the IT Act. So the ratio of that case is that uh, both the statutes are independent. Uh, effective June 2012, uh, all copyright violations would today be governed uh, by the Copyright Act and uh, for other kinds of internet wrongs, one would need to look to the IT Act. Just, uh, actually I think no, you want to respond to the same thing. I, I, I do, but if uh, Professor has something to add to that on that no, point. No, no, I think I just want to clarify the question because uh, Section 51 has to be understood in the context of Section 52. The MySpace judgment uh, is not looking at uh, that there is a provision on Section 52 uh, to exclude somebody from responsibility in case of uh, storage. Now, of course, he is correct. The terminology used in Section 52 is similar to that of Section 51. But then, in the context of Section 52, 50, uh, 51, 50, uh, 52, 51 has to be read in the uh, read along with 50 uh, uh, to uh, subclass C. That means the court needs to ask the question: When there is a storage, is there an exemption for storage to attract liability as in future, whether it is direct liability? It's a second, it's a, no, indirect liability. That means the court needs to read Section 52, uh, 1, B, and C and exclude people completely if it falls under Section 52, 1, B and ask the question of liability under 1, C if it falls under 1, C. So I don't think the my, my, my statement hold valid in the context of post-amendment because the court has not looked into whether there are any exceptions available, uh, but they say to intend you to accept some people in that context. So it has to be really right. basically, and the court can't read it. That's the case they are reading it long. But prima facie of the judgment is wrong. I feel that it's wrong because they should have understood. If they expand uh, the place to include uh, uh, you know, cyberspace as well, they have a responsibility to understand what's the type of liability and exception that comes under the uh, you know, internet context. You can't uh, expand one part of the uh, act uh, by saying that legislature has intended and fail to interpret the same standard to the other part of the uh, uh, um, uh, section by saying that this part will be very conservative, which shows the judge's inconsistency with the stand he takes on expanding uh, the responsibility. Thank you. I'd like to make two quick points on, on this issue. One, to uh, answer the question about 79. Uh, there is no way. Uh, I, I, th there's an attempt being made uh, to uh, construe the two harmoniously by saying 79 and uh, specifically the intermediary guidelines rules would apply only to uh, government notifications. Unfortunately, that's not possible because uh, the 79 uh, intermediary guidelines rules are specifically uh, in the draft version. They were limited to uh, notices sent by the government. In the final version, that is specifically removed. Okay, so it so anyone can send notices under the intermediate guidelines rules, and the terms and service uh, that that are uh, that are listed in uh, Rule Three, Sub Rule Two, uh, are to be uh, are to be used by every single intermediary out there, from every cyber cafe, to every ISP, to every DNS provider, to every web host, to to any person who can reasonably be construed as an intermediary uh, under uh, the IT Act. Now, that's a problem. So, on the one hand, you have the IT Act seemingly wishing to exclude in Section 81 cop uh, stuff relating to copyright and patents. Why patents? Don't ask me. But seemingly wanting to do so. And then you have the new rules in 2011 which wish to include copyright within the IT Act again. So th there's complete lack of consistency there. Secondly, uh, uh, 
the, the standard provided in the intermediary guidelines rules is very different from the standard provided on uh, either through uh, section 51.1 uh, or in section 52.1 B and C. Okay, so there's uh, even at that level, uh, the, the standards are completely different. For one, all you need is a complaint saying that my uh, I my right has been violated. You don't have to show proof. You don't have to show anything. We, as a matter of fact, sent. Uh, frivolous complaints to seven different kinds of intermediaries, six out of the seven complied, even though they shouldn't have. Uh, so, so the fact is that that problem, uh, that dichotomy is there between the two laws. Quickly on, on the uh, issue of 52, uh, 1, B and C. Well, they don't talk about uh, storage, really. Uh, they talk about transient or incidental storage of a work or performance, both B and C, uh, which uh, I seem to be reading much more narrowly. Uh, I'm very glad that, that someone, I, I would like to give a very expansive reading to this, and I'm glad that other people are giving even more expansive readings to it than I am. So I'm quite happy about that fact. But in my reading, 52.1b applies only to things such as ISPs and, uh, you know, virtual uh, private network providers, VPNs, uh, whereas, uh, and, and uh, possibly even content delivery network CDNs, whereas 52.1c uh, primarily applies to things uh, such as search engines. Uh, so whether other kinds of online services, including things like MySpace, YouTube, or webhosts, or anything else that aren't uh, engaged in storage that is transient or incidental, uh, it would be, it's, it's up to your reading of the word incidental that, uh, that you could say whether they get covered or not. So, uh, so for, for me, it's, it's not very, uh, it's not a very clear case of uh, my space judgment being negated through 52, uh, 1B and C. I wish it were more clear because, uh, as a matter of fact, we've just intervened in that case and, and want to see uh, that uh, what I consider deeply flawed judgment uh, overruled.